alternates or presidents before. To everybody, good morning again, and to the jurors, good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And Dr. White, good morning again, sir. Do you again acknowledge you're still under oath and still sworn to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Thank Your you. Honor. Resumption of cross-examination. Mr. Waldman. Thank you. Dr. White, so you were telling us that you met with uh, Dr. Ornelas uh, last week. That was the first time you met with her. Or, yes. or spoke it, to her. If I may give some background, um, just... No, I, I want to know when you first spoke to her. That was last week? Yes, I spoke to an individual involved in the defense, and he recommended that to answer my questions about Dr. Schaefer's model, which was presented to me for the first time about 10 days ago, that I consult with um, Dr. Mellon Ornalis, who's an expert in pharmacokinetics. You're aware that... Uh Dr. Schaefer actually provided his spreadsheet and software uh, to the defense. You're aware of that, correct? Yes, I am, but I did not see his, his infusion theory until uh, very recently for the first time. And what time. you had provided to the people from Dr. Anellis is a piece of paper with computer code written all over it. No software, correct? I was not asked to provide software, so... All I provided was the printout. Yes, sir. Can you make sense of this computer code? I think I said earlier that uh, pharmacokinetic modeling is, is not my expertise. So you knew this wouldn't uh, mean anything to me, right? I don't know your expertise, sir. It certainly would mean something to Dr. Schaefer since she used uh, the same model that Dr. Schaefer used in his modeling, namely the model by uh, Dr. Schneider. Did you ask Dr. Ornelas to provide the software to the people? Overall, you may answer it. Um, I don't recall that I even thought about it. Had you ever heard of... Uh, Dr. Ornelas, before someone in the defense team told you to contact her? No, I had never met Dr. Ornelas. My question was, have you ever, had you ever even heard of her? Well, I didn't do a PubMed had, search, if that's what you're asking. Had uh, you ever heard of her? In the pharmacokinetic field, in, your, you know, in anesthesiology, have you ever, had you ever heard of Dr. Ornelas before someone from the defense team told you to contact her, yes or no? The answer is no. Now, after uh, following the uh, point in time when you rejected the theory of oral ingestion of propofol, uh, was it then your theory that uh, Michael Jackson consumed uh, the eight lorazepam pills at 10, 10 a.m.? I... It's some time after I wrote the letter to Mr. Flanagan and prior to my appearance at court in L.A. Um, at some point, did you advance the theory uh, that Michael Jackson consumed the eight two-milligram lorazepam pills at 10 a.m.? I don't think there was any specific theory put forth. It was a discussion about whether a large number of lorazepam pills could have been consumed at some time prior to the administration of uh, the final fatal dose of propofol. Well, you were present in court uh, when Mr. Flanagan repeatedly put forth hypotheticals specifically saying, asking witnesses to assume lorazepam um, <clears throat> pills were swallowed at 10 a.m., correct? You recall those hypotheticals? Uh, actually, I don't. Um, and you're aware that uh, there's a uh, two-hour, basically, peak in lorazepam. So if you put forth a theory at 10 a.m., that would fit nicely to the peak hitting at noon uh, when you would opine that Michael Jackson self-injected propofol, correct? One, in reading the literature, it does suggest that the peak effect occurs in one to two hours. However, you have to reconcile that with the residual uh, that might be present in the stomach if the pills are taken orally. And Dr. Schaefer testified uh, that 10 a.m. 
uh, oral administration of lorazepam was impossible based on the amount in the stomach and the absorption that would take place. He testified while you sat here and took notes, he testified that it would have had to have occurred at least four hours prior, correct? I think he said four to six hours is what I recall. And then following that, at some point you met with Dr. Anellis and created a computer model where you now put the time of lorazepam administration by Michael Jackson at around 7 a.m. So it would fall outside of the window uh, that Dr. Schaefer testified to, correct? Dr. Anellis used the same models that Dr. Schaefer employed in his analysis. Um, the the, to the work lorazepam back. pills, that was an assumption you were putting into the model, correct? And you told her to put it at 7 a.m., correct? That, it's a compound question. Could you refine it, please? You Sustained by the court. You told Dr. Ornelas to put in a 7 a.m. administration of oral lorazepam, correct? Incorrect. She came up with that on her own? She was watching the trial and Dr. Schaefer's testimony on TV. Okay, so she knew then uh, what window of time to use from watching it on TV. She knew then that 10 a.m. Uh, was impossible, correct? I think she looked at the Greenblatt articles um, that we discussed and uh, figured out how much time for dissolution, how much time for absorption, um, and on that basis in the concentration that was found at autopsy, made various, created various scenarios just as Dr. Schaefer has created various scenarios based on con a single concentration found at the time of autopsy. They're both working backwards, both utilize the same right, pharmacokinetic no models. But the 10 a.m. hypothetical is no longer being put forth and now it's 7 a.m. and that was put forth following Dr. Schaefer's testimony, correct? I'm not aware of that. I never put forth the 10 a.m. model, so I I can't. So you don't know where that information. Allow the witness to finish, please. So I can't. I, so I can't really make a judgment because it was never my opinion, um, nor was I aware that was put forth as the time at which the proposed oral doses were given. I think what I said on Friday, if I may, was that it's possible that there were multiple doses taken orally at different time intervals prior to uh, seven or eight a.m. I think I said 7 a.m. Well, that would drastically change the simulation. I mean, what the simulation shows is 7 a.m., correct? Yeah, that's if all the pills, I think, were taken at the same time. But that's the simulation you presented, correct? I presented two simulations, sir. One had an assumption that there was no prior administration of lorazepam. That is, no preexisting, which I really think is unlikely, and then a more likely scenario that shows the lorazepam that one would expect to be present from the day before because lorazepam has a very long half-life. If, Con if uh, Michael Jackson had come to you, Dr. White, and indicated that he would like to hire you to administer propofol to him uh, to put him to sleep each night in his bedroom, would you do it? Absolutely not. That would be a job that I would never consider accepting. just because of the owner's requirements in terms of time. Thank you. Oh, just because of time? That's the only reason? Well, I, I, would, I would reject well, let's, it. Yeah, let's clear this up. Just because of time? I said the time alone would, would, would uh, be a factor that I wouldn't even consider, would make me not even want to consider it. Setting aside the concern about your time, uh, would you consider... Uh, if Michael Jackson had asked you to give him propofol each night to put him to sleep in his bedroom, uh, other than time concerns, are you saying you would do it? I'm saying I wouldn't even consider it. Is that because of concerns about time? It, it's something that no amount of money could convince me to accept or take on as a responsibility because of time, because of just the responsibility for someone, and the fact that this was a complete off-label use of the drug which had not been studied prior to, as you know, 2011. Okay, so you would not do it? Correct. Okay.
Now, in the uh, simulation regarding propofol, in which you put forth to the jury that Michael Jackson um, self-administered, uh, I believe it was 1140 on the simulation. Is that accurate? Sometime just before noon? Correct. And in putting no, forth that scenario, uh, there were a number of assumptions you had to make because, for one thing, there's no medical records to reference, correct? Yeah, I'm sorry. Did you say 1140 or 1040? Uh, 1140 for your theory of Michael Jackson self-administering? Okay, something around 1140 10 to 1150, yes. Okay. And there, had, there were a large number of assumptions that had to be made uh, because, for one thing, there are no medical records to reference, correct? Yes, there were a number of assumptions required for all the models that have been presented before the court. And in your uh, simulation that Dr. Ornelas uh, created for you, um, you're basing this uh, on Conrad Murray's statement that he left the room for two minutes uh, and then these events took place and Conrad Murray came back to the room. Uh, is, is that the time period you're referencing, the two minutes that Conrad Murray indicated in the statement to police? No, that is not. So that's a different, in, in your analysis of the, the case, Dr. Murray leaving for two minutes is a different time period than when this scenario transpired. Is that correct? I, yes, I guess the answer is yes. Can I just add that I never asked Dr. Ornelas to make the simulations. I merely ask her a very simple question, and that is, could she help me understand how much free propofol and propofol metabolite might be expected in the urine at the time of autopsy if Mr. Jackson had received 1,000 milligrams as opposed to 25 milligrams? When did you... Uh begin or request the animal study regarding oral propofol? Shortly after I prepared my report, I had a discussion with Mr. Flanagan um, questioning myself. When, the, when, my question is, when did you, when did you? I think it you... was in, it was, uh, Perhaps after being shown a copy of Dr. Schaefer's report. I can't be sure, but that would be a possibility that that would have stimulated my interest. That was the first time I became aware of the piglet study because that didn't come up on my Medline search. And because you searched for oral propofol and it didn't come up and your research was concluded, correct? Yes, that's what I was looking for. And then you got Dr. Schaefer's report, which is dated April 15, 2011. Uh, had you done any research between March 8, 2011 and April 18, 2011 to confirm that your preliminary thoughts were accurate? No, I had not done any research. Okay, so when did you request this animal study? Can you tell me which month? Uh, we discussed it either at the end of April or in May. And did you do the study or did you have someone do it for you? No, uh, Mr. Flanagan stated that he knew a veterinarian in Indiana who could conduct the study. Initially, the study was so you, to be... Let me just ask. So you had nothing to do with the study as a scientist? I did not directly participate, no. Mr. Flanagan had someone do the study in Indiana? Uh, that's correct. Did you oversee it in any way? I was not directly involved, as you said. Okay, so... So Mr. Flanagan requested an animal study in Indiana sometime after you received Dr. Schaefer's report. Is that correct? Correct. And this was someone he knew uh, in Indiana. That's what was relayed to you. Yes, that he knew a veterinarian who was capable of doing a study which would evaluate oral absorption of propofol. And what kind of animals were these? I think initially they considered a study in piglets because the study that Dr. Schaefer quoted, the rectal study, which I don't believe is uh, totally... What kind of animals were these? 
Initially, they were proposed to do piglets, and then the decision was made to use beagles since they could more easily accept an oral gastric tube so that we could be sure that the drug was actually in the stomach and not influenced by the mucosa of the oral pharynx or the mucosa of the esophagus. So the tube was put in their stomach. It doesn't hurt the animals, and uh, doses of propofol were then administered. Ian Glenn is commonly referred to as the father of propofol, correct? I, I, Ian is the inventor. He's a laboratory scientist. He's a good friend, um, and he played a major role in the development of propofol from a, from an, a laboratory molecule uh, to where it began clinical use. So I guess I, I don't the definition of father. Some people have called me the father of propofol. I, Some people call Ian Glenn the father of propofol, correct? That's true, I okay. guess. I, and he's someone you look up to? Ian, I consider a friend, yes. Okay. And he told you that uh, propofol had no oral bioavailability, in his opinion, based on uh, research he had done many years ago, correct? He didn't really say he had researched it. He said it was his understanding that studies had been done in rats or some rodent model, and uh, it didn't appear to have an effect except after a massive dose had been administered. That's more or less. I'd have to look at the emails to be sure. Okay. So did you, you had indicated earlier that at some point you had called Ian Glenn, and he had shared that information with you, right? It was actually an electronic communication, which I shared with Dr. Schaefer. Okay. The, uh, Ian Glenn shared information with you regarding uh, his belief, his opinions regarding oral propofol and it not being bioavailable, right? That was correct. Okay. And that, sometime was that bef in, sometime when? I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Um, certainly um, a month or two, probably two months after I received the report by Dr. Schaefer. Now this this study on the beagles in Indiana that uh, Mr. Flanagan commissioned, uh, did you ever review any data or were you provided any reports uh, in regard to that study? Uh, no formal report, only an oral report that it had no effect, which confirmed and what my suspicion was and it confirmed what Dr. Schaefer proposed. In and who his provided you this oral report? Mr. Flanagan. As a scientist, you weren't interested in uh, getting the data or speaking to the people that did the research? It was a negative study that confirmed what um, Dr. Glenn had suggested and what Dr. Schaefer had suggested. And, conf you know, I was aware of the extensive first pass metabolism when propofol is absorbed and passes through the liver. So I didn't see a negative study, I didn't see a need to pursue it. And to be honest, I was quite shocked to hear that Dr. Schaefer had taken the oral medication and commissioned a study in human beings. You were aware of first pass metabolism when you wrote your March 8th report saying uh, oral propofol was a possibility? I was aware there is, uh, yeah, it's absorbed and goes through the liver, yes. But it doesn't mean it can't potentially have an effect. Well, you attributed it as a possible cause of death. And you did that when you were aware of the basic principle of first pass metabolism? Sir, a study had never been conducted in animals, a published study in animals or in humans with oral propofol until Dr. Schaefer performed a study. And I have to assume that my colleagues, uh, Dr. Sepulveda and Dr. Schaefer, would not commission a study if they didn't feel it had some value. Actually, Ian the, Glenn's study uh, was oral, right? Ian Glenn's study was not published in a peer-reviewed journal. And you, I'm said not aware no, you said there were no studies involving oral propofol. Ian Glenn's study, uh, which I think was uh, uh, possibly in the 80s, that dealt with oral propofol, correct? Your Honor, that's an improper question. It assumes facts, not in evidence. It's a question asking <clears throat> about a study. I'm going to sustain the objection to the form of the question. <clears throat> you were aware of Ian Glenn's paper uh, that discussed oral propofol and it not being bioavailable based on his animal study, correct? Incorrect. I think I stated earlier I was unaware of any studies in either animals or in human beings. But you were aware of the uh, first pass metabolism and still felt that uh, oral propofol uh, was a viable theory in this case in March 
2011. A lot of drugs have first-pass metabolism that still have a clinical effect after oral administration, so that does not rule out the possibility. And so what ruled it out, though, was just Mr. Flanagan calling you and saying, I, I know someone in Indiana that did this study, and he told me the findings were it's not bioavailable, and you were satisfied then based on that conversation? That's not what I've stated. To restate it again, what I said was I got Schaefer's report, um, which suggested that this was unlikely. I had Actually, a, he said it was not possible. Okay, not possible. I, but if he thought it was not possible, he then did a study. But I talked. I then communicated electronically with Dr. Glenn, who also confirmed that it was his understanding that some that animal studies done by Imperial Chemical Industries uh, in the 70s, I believe, suggested it wouldn't be effective. And based on those two remarks and um, Mr. Flanagan confirming that the study he commissioned with uh, propofol administered through an oral gastric tube, it seemed fairly convincing to me. Um, I didn't see a need to pursue it further. And so just to be clear, then, you never requested any data or any findings. Uh, Mr. Flanagan told you it was negative and you were satisfied, correct? Yes. Was this a way to uh, essentially save face so you didn't have to say that it was Dr. Schaefer's report that caused you to change your mind? That's argumentative. Sustain. How long did the study last involving the Beagles? As I stated earlier, I was not involved in the study. Uh, I think it was done sometime during the summer, and uh, I I don't know when it was concluded, it began or concluded. Now, in the scenario that you've um, put forth, uh, just to be clear then, when Michael Jackson, in your mind, self-ingested the 25 milligrams or self-administered the uh, 25 milligrams, uh, was in, in your scenario, that's not the time period when Conrad Murray left the room for two minutes? Is that your testimony? My testimony is I cannot be sure of the time frame because I understand from phone records that I have reviewed um, that after observing Mr. Jackson for a period of 20 to 30 minutes, um, Dr. Murray had gotten some phone calls and he began returning phone calls in an My question is, is it your opinion that when Michael Jackson uh, self-administered the 25 milligrams of propofol, is that taking place in your mind when Conrad Murray leaves for two minutes, or is it at a different point in time that Conrad Murray left Michael Jackson alone? It could well be at a different time. I don't know that the time is established. Uh, and in your scenarios, based on the evidence in this case, uh, when you put forth that Michael Jackson uh, may have consumed eight two-milligram lorazepam tablets at 7 a.m., does that also assume that Conrad Murray has left Michael Jackson alone? Not necessarily, because I understand that Mr. Jackson walked around. He apparently had another Objection, bed. motion to strike. Okay. The objection is sustained. The answer stricken. Disregard it. Refine your question, please. Is your analysis and the theory you put forth, does it assume Conrad Murray was out of the room when Michael Jackson, uh, according to you, consumed eight two milligram lorazepam tablets? He could have been in some place, presumably, away from Mr. Does your Jackson. analysis assume? I, I, think, I think the witness is responding to the uh, question. You can follow it up. You can finish your answer, Dr. White. I assume that Dr. Murray was in some other part of the room. I think there was an ante room and a bathroom. Uh, adjacent to the bedroom. Actually, uh, my understanding is there was two bedrooms um, connected. And since he apparently moved between the bedrooms, um, I think it's likely Mr. Dr. Murray was somewhere in the vicinity, but certainly um, Mr. Jackson had the capability of going into uh, either room and does your analysis assume that Conrad Murray was unaware that Michael Jackson uh, swallowed eight two mil milligram tablets? Yes. So he was either in a different room or not watching. Is that fair to say? Fair to say. And then you know from Conrad Murray's statement 
Uh, the only time he tells the police in his statement that's been introduced into evidence, uh, the only time he tells the police that he left the room was uh, two minutes to use the restroom. And when he came back, he found Michael Jackson not breathing, correct? But we also know he was Is on... Is that correct? I believe that was the statement in the, in the police interview, okay. yes. So we have the time when he's either gone or not paying attention at 7 a.m., correct? Based on, your, <coughs> based on your scenario. Excuse me. Based on your scenario. On or around that time. Okay, the then we have, the, we have the two minutes that he tells the police he was gone uh, and that he comes back after two minutes and finds Michael not, uh, not breathing but with a pulse, correct? We have that time frame. I think the two minutes refers to when he was in the restroom. Okay. Um, there and then was, we also have, uh, you're saying, under your analysis, it's a different time uh, based on your analysis uh, when Michael Jackson self-administers the 25 milligrams of propofol, correct? I'm not sure, sir. All I said was that I've reviewed the phone records where Mr. Murray was on his cell phone, presumably away from Mr. Jackson because Mr. Jackson was trying to sleep. And that's just a common sense uh, assumption, right, that if his whole job is to put Michael Jackson to sleep, uh, when he's on the phone for a lengthy period of time, uh, he's probably not standing there in Michael Jackson's presence, correct? That's what I would assume, yes. So at whatever point uh, this happened, then you're assuming uh, in your scenario where Michael Jackson self-administers 25 milligrams, uh, you're assuming that uh, he's in bed and at some point, Conrad Murray leaves him, right? Correct. And as you demonstrated on Friday, uh, that Michael Jackson then uh, gets a hold of a syringe and draws up um, 2.5 milligrams of lidocaine, correct? I don't believe that's what I said, sir. What did he do in regard to lidocaine based on your uh, computer model that Dr. Anellis created? Um, my understanding is that Dr. Murray drew up 50 milligrams of propofol and 50 milligrams of lidocaine into a 10 cc or 10 milliliter syringe. And he. Had so your scenario is assuming that Conrad Murray drew up a syringe and left it there? Is that, he, is that what you're assuming in your scenario? Yes or no? Can I finish my. No, what you're relaying is uh, something the court's already ruled on. Uh, what I'm asking you is, are you assuming uh, that Michael Jackson drew up the syringe or Conrad Murray? Which one? I'm assuming that it's the 25, extra 25 milligrams that uh, Dr. Murray had drawn up that was self -administered. So Conrad Murray drew up the syringe in your analysis? Yes or no? Yes. And he left this syringe then uh, in the bedroom when he left the bedroom? First of all, I don't know that he left the bedroom. I'm told that he was standing in kind of a hallway. Objection. Okay. Non-responsive. The, the, prior the objection ruling. sustained. The answer stricken. You can answer the specific question if you're able to. You will rephrase the question, Mr. Walgren. I'm asking about the computer simulation you presented to this jury. In that analysis, uh, is there an assumption made uh, that Conrad Murray drew up a syringe and left it in the bedroom? Yes or no? There is no assumption about who drew up the drug in the computer simulation. In your statement that this was the most reasonable uh, interpretation, are you assuming that Conrad Murray drew up the drug in the syringe or Michael Jackson? I thought I stated earlier that I felt it was Conrad Murray. Okay, thank you. And that Conrad Murray then leaves the room, leaves the patient in the bed uh, with the syringe accessible to the patient, correct? That's one of your assumptions? I did not say where the syringe was left. I said Conrad Murray left the patient after observing him for 25 to 30 minutes um, to make some phone calls. And There's nothing in the police statement where he references making phone calls, Dr. White. You've been told repeatedly. Uh, that your opinion is to be based on the evidence in this case. Do you understand that? Your Honor, that's, that's an improper construction. I'm sustaining, I'm sustaining uh, the defense uh, objection. The evidence in this case, the only evidence in this case, 
from Conrad Murray's own mouth is that he left Well, the- I, I, if that's how you're going to phrase it, fine. But, but there is other evidence in the case. Yes. So uh, Dr. White is referencing phone records, which is in evidence. Rephrase your question, please. You would agree that in the statement Conrad Murray gave to the police, he only references leaving Michael Jackson alone uh, during that brief two-minute period, correct? I believe that's correct, yes, sir. But you don't believe this all could have transpired within two minutes, uh, and so it's your opinion that this took place when uh, Conrad Murray was on the telephone for a lengthier period of time. Is that correct? That's pretty correct, yes, more or less correct, yeah. So in your scenario, how long would Conrad Murray have had to leave Michael Jackson unattended in order for Michael Jackson to uh, self-administer the propofol? Well, it's hard to say without knowing exactly where the syringe was. And um, what I do know is that the phone records suggest that after this observation period, Dr. Murray was on the phone for a time of 35 to 40 minutes, I believe. I've not... And that's the time period that you believe this event transpired. Is that fair? Uh, Followed by a two-minute period where I guess he went into the restroom to relieve himself. And it was sometime during that 40-minute period where I believe uh, Mr. Jackson had the opportunity and likely self-administered the final fatal dose of propofol. Yes. And I believe in your scenario, Michael Jackson does this through the port <coughs> on the IV tubing. Is that accurate? I'm sorry. Um, through the side port? Yes. The Y port? Is that your theory? That would be the likely site, yes. And in your analysis, was that syringe uh, left in that port uh, for Michael to have access to it, or was it left somewhere else, or do you simply not have an opinion in that regard? I really don't have an opinion, Um, although I think there was a syringe with a needle attached in that side port. Well, if the syringe, for example, had been left, uh, let's say, on a chair filled with the propofol that you described, and Conrad Murray came back into the room and found Michael Jackson not breathing, and now the syringe is in the port, don't you think that would raise alarms to Conrad Murray? Sustain, that's the form of the question. Don't you think that would be something uh, that would uh, key him into the fact that he left the syringe on the chair, for example, and now it's been moved into the, the Y port? Objection still calls for it. Sustain. Are you assuming that the syringe was left in the Y port uh, when Conrad Murray left Michael Jackson alone? No, I'm not. <clears throat> So the syringe is left somewhere under your analysis. Uh, Conrad Murray is inattentive or gone out of the room for 35 to 40 minutes. That's your assumption, correct? I don't think I said he went out of the room. I understand that he was off to the side. I said inattentive or out of the room. I mean, he's not watching, correct? He's not directly watching Mr. Jackson. That's correct. Well, you're not putting forth to this jury that Conrad Murray stood there and watched Michael Jackson self-administer propofol, are you? No, I am not. Okay, so during, in your theory then, during this 35 to 40 minutes, Conrad Murray is not watching Michael Jackson, correct? Correct. And under your theory, Conrad Murray has left uh, the propofol in a syringe somewhere in that room, correct? Uh, That's an assumption, yes. And during this period of absence, then, it's your theory uh, that Michael Jackson woke up and self-administered the 25 milligrams uh, and killed himself. That's what we have, uh, I suggested in my testimony on Friday, correct? And are you assuming then that after Michael Jackson did that, that he fell back uh, 
in the uh, same location he'd been on the bed prior to Conrad Murray leaving the room? Well, it would be my assumption that once he secured the syringe from wherever it was left, that he probably returned to bed. He, the IV was in, in his leg, but clearly accessible in the prone position. Did you say he probably returned to bed? Before he injected the propofol? Yes, I would think so. So you're assuming he got up out of bed to get the propofol? He, he could have got up out of bed. I, I understand that he moved around the room. So okay, You know he had a condom catheter on attached to a urine bag, right? Yeah, condom catheter. Right, did you know that? Yes, I did. Okay, and you knew he was hooked up to an IV line attached to a pole, right? An IV stand. An IV stand, which I think has wheels and is mobile. So just to be clear, under your scenario, though, we have Michael Jackson then walking around the room, wheeling the IV stand and, and holding his uh, urine bag connected to a condom catheter? Urine bags normally, and again, I didn't see the evidence to comment on but Okay, urine, then you're speculating. But normally they're attached to the leg the upper leg by some elastic bands. That's the typical uh, arrangement. So and so Michael Jackson's walking around, wheeling the IV stand, uh, attached to a condom catheter, and Conrad Murray is somewhere else uh, on the phone. That's the assumption underlying your uh, scenario, correct? That's assuming the... Is that correct, that you're assuming those facts? He's not being allowed to answer the question. Well, it, it's asking for that assumption, and if the witness can answer, fine. The objections overruled. Are you assuming that scenario? That's not the only scenario. It's a possible scenario, yes. And of course, you would agree a possible scenario is uh, that Conrad Murray administered more propofol, correct? It's a possible scenario. It's possible if he wanted to potentially harm Mr. Jackson. So are you saying that? By Michael, if Michael Jackson did it, he was doing it to harm himself? I don't think he realized the potential danger. So my answer is no, sorry. Now, is it your testimony that what Michael Jackson wanted was uh, simply light sedation? I think Mr. Jackson wanted to sleep. He was suffering from... That wouldn't be light sedation, would it? It would be light sedation, yes. It would? Michael Jackson uh, has told Cheryl Lee, uh, nurse practitioner, uh, as well as other doctors, that she want, they wanted to be knocked out. Were you aware of that in your review of the evidence? I hadn't heard the term knockout, but that's frequently used to refer to an unconscious state. I don't generally like to use that term because to me it connotes taking a hammer and hitting someone on the head and knocking them out. Um, and generally I th think what he was referring to if he used that term was just being um, uh, in a restful sleep of some state. Is it state. your testimony that, uh, in your opinion, Michael Jackson hired Conrad Murray to put him to sleep with propofol, and that all he wanted was uh, light sedation or minimal sedation? Is that your testimony? No, that is not my testimony. Okay. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? Well, it was my understanding that... that wouldn't make any sense, would it? That if you're hiring a doctor to put you to sleep, that you just want light Overall. sedation? All right, wait a minute. We have uh, people speaking over each other. The objections overruled. Would you re-ask re the question? Let me show you what you reference, uh, defense quadruple G. And for mm -hmm. minimal sedation, uh, you stated that it, you have a normal response to verbal stimulation. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't make any sense to think someone has hired someone to give them propofol to sleep, and they want to be in a state where they have normal response to verbal stimulation, is it? Well, many patients have trouble sleeping because they're extremely anxious. Um, they're, they're, I'm not a sleep expert, so I really prefer not to talk about the etiology of primary or secondary insomnia disorders. Does it make sense to you, doctor, in your review of, of the evidence in this case that Michael Jackson would hire Dr. Murray for the purpose of putting him to sleep with propofol and then only want light sedation 
where he would have normal response to verbal stimulation. Does that make sense to you? Overruled in terms of 801. You may answer. Uh, it's my understanding Does that, that make sense to you? I don't think that was the scenario. So it does not make sense to you, correct? I, I'm, I would appreciate if you'd re-ask a more specific question. You agree. You've reviewed Conrad Murray's statement to the police, right? Yes, in February. And you agree that Conrad Murray indicated uh, that he was hired and he soon learned that his, uh, what he was doing was administering propofol nearly every night to put Michael to sleep.